going to talk about the Todd Howard interview today. It's a three-hour epic interview. We covered all kinds of topics from Starfield, Fallout, The Elder Scrolls, new games, all kinds of things. We're going to focus mainly on the games we cover on this channel, mainly Starfield, Fallout, maybe a touch of Elder Scrolls, and uh, go from there. I made a list, and I'm going to give you the modest perspective on the interview, because I know a lot of people are covering the interview, and they're covering it from a player's perspective. But I'm a modder, and I see a few things in the interview that they probably don't, so let's get into it, shall we? I made a list. I'm going to go down the list, right? So first of all, NPCs will still work when you're not around. Yeah, we call that AI packages, right? AI packages basically let the NPC move around, you know, according to a schedule. So at 12 o'clock, they're supposed to be in a shop, they go to a shop. You know, at 1 o'clock, they're supposed to be in the pub, they go to the pub. When you're not there, the primary difference in all the games so far is all the doors and walls disappear. The NPC just moves as if there's nothing there to stop it. Which means if you locked an NPC in a room and you left and its package says it has to be in another room, it would somehow leave the locked room because the door would just disappear when you're not there. But Todd Howard said he's going to make some improvements in that area. And uh, hopefully it means if you put an NPC in a room, it will stay in that room. <laughs> Although, to be honest, I don't see how that would work with the AI packages. You'd have to have something else going on to hold them. He also said, what would it be like to have a fighter's guild? Says, uh, what, what would a fighter's guild or a major's guild be doing in a fantasy universe? Um, that's a good question. When I made my Skyrim fighter's guild mod, I asked the same question. And I was trying to make the fighter's guild an interesting guild to be part of. And it was bloody difficult. It was, because it was always a go for guild you know they should have called it the gopher guild go for this go for that kill this kill that because that's all it really is so what i did is i linked it to local stories i made sure there was a story behind every mission not just can you go and kill some rats you know you know the mission i'm talking about right? it says it was go here there's uh, something going on there and then you get a background story from the player and it immersed you into the game and it added a little bit of a you know background to the area you were in and what you were doing and it made it more interesting and it brought factions to life and i think i achieved it i was really proud of the fact that after years of thinking about it and trying to work out how to make it work i achieved my goal and i think they're going to be doing something similar in the future with their guilds and quests well guilds hopefully anyway because they're at the are a bit shallow in many cases i think um the Dark Brotherhood and the Thieves Guild are usually the best guilds, but they're not best guilds because of um, you know background story. They're the best guild because of the features, you know, the stealth and things like that. So, adding that would add a new dimension to Bethesda's games. Now, I've already been doing this, so I know the benefits of it, and I know it would work. Also, they want about um, what would the guild be doing when you're not there. So I've mentioned that they had decided to start up a new project and you didn't return for a couple of weeks. The project would be well on the way by the time you returned. You probably missed a few missions. That kind of thing, you know. It'd be a bit of a waste of a script, but, you know, I think it'd be a good idea to head down that road because it make people hang around the guild and maybe complete a guild before moving on to the next. That kind of thing. Although I'm not too sure that would be good for gameplay. But it's good to see uh, Bethesda and Todd Howard thinking in these terms because that fleshes out guilds and factions more than anything else I can think of. So that's a major plus for me. Um, more AI in future games. I was expecting that. AIs, you know, that can think about things, what they want to do, be more autonomous. Maybe be more predictive of where you're going to go, what's going to happen next. Even in your own base, you know, an AI that can predict what you're going to need next, that kind of thing. Or an AI that thinks you're getting too strong, we're going to have to attack you. You can, in fact, if you think of it this way, imagine you had an AI in charge of a faction and the faction monitored what you were doing. I'm not on about getting some magical knowledge that you couldn't possibly know. I mean, based on your own actions. Because they do say in this that companions will be responding to uh, things that you like or they liked or disliked about what you've just done and have a temporary mood swing about it. So if we do the same thing with AIs and um, say a pirate faction notices you've been raiding their uh, buildings, maybe the AI would decide to raid some of yours back. 
you know, and you respond in that kind of way, in a very dynamic, less scripted kind of way. I mean, it'd be quite good. But AIs are quite good at just doing their own thing, you know, being like another player in the game. And uh, that is one of the more exciting aspects of an AI, if you ask me. I've done an awful lot of AI mods over the years, usually to improve games because the developer made a really crappy job of the AI and it was just annoying, especially in single-player games because they went through a phase where there was a multiplayer fa fad, you know, where people were just saying, oh, you don't need to bother with single-player, we'll just do it multiplayer. So basically it meant they released half a game. You know, with multiplayer means you didn't need no AIs, you didn't need no missions, you didn't need no quests or anything like that. You just let the players do it. So they're releasing half a game and claiming it was a full game. So when they did do a multi single player campaign, it was short, the AI was crap, it was that kind of thing. So AI development was something I looked into quite heavily. I got quite good at it. In some cases, um, people were talking about, you know, players on MechWarrior servers and it wasn't players, it was my bots. They didn't know the difference. But they can make a big difference in the game when scripted. And it is down to how you script them and how they learn. You can, for example, have an AI pick up on things, you know, like based on what it sees you do. Until it sees you doing it, it doesn't know anything about it. And then once it's seen you do it, it remembers. And it can do it too. Or it can learn how to compensate. Right, um... Tile, tile systems used to create planets. Well, tile system. Basically, they get multiple tiles, they put them together to create a planet. This planet itself, you know, can be, well, technically speaking, what they do is they put it together and then they kind of merge it together, you know, so it's seamless. But the planet itself could probably have um, a texture put over the top of these tiles to change the colour and then have level lists just spawn anything it wants on it. And I have done a video about the uh, level 40 system lock limit you know, on the game, because that's something else Todd spoke of, and it's related to what I'm talking about now. But it's such a big topic that I wanted to cover it separately. So we'll go into that in another video. But the tile system, you put it together, texture of the top, level is spawn on top, anything you like can appear there. Now, if you imagine each tile has its a unique spot on it where you could have a base or, you know, a pirate faction or anything like that, and you enter a system... And it automatically chooses what goes on those spaces and if that space is going to have anything at all. For instance, where you place your base might be limited to the spots where aren't used by pirate factions or mining groups or anything like that. It might be in the same kind of locations, if you know what I mean. But if every, if every um, tile has locations on it where you can plant things, then every tile can be pre-designed. It won't be quite like No Man's Sky where it's just all over the place. It will be pre-designed so you can say, right, this tile's always going to be interesting. It's not going to have these weird hills with stupid landscapes because it's been No Man's Sky to death. It will be designed to look interesting. And then when you go to another planet, they can shuffle the same tiles around and do it again. So it appears to be in a different place when actually it's the same tile. It's just got a different texture over the top. That said, though, you know, the system itself isn't too bad. I mean, when you're actually creating um, tiles, you know, you're customizing and building them yourself, you can put all kinds of interesting, interesting features onto it. It gets away from that kind of like um, procedurally generated feel and more into something like we expect from Skyrim or Oblivion or things like that. So it is a better system, if you ask me. Um, there is, it's a bit complicated in a way, don't get me wrong, there's quite a lot I could say on that, which uh, I'm just going to skip over for now because the video will be too long otherwise. But it is an interesting system and it does make me think that it's going to be a much, much better procedurally generated world than, say, No Man's Sky is. Now, um, companions temporarily displeased and robots, you know, combat robots. Apparently, um, companions are going to get slightly annoyed at you, you know, if you do things they don't like. In a gameplay terms, if you're trying to get closer to a character, you won't want to upset them, so you'll be doing things that will please them, so that would determine how your game unfolds. On the other hand, if you want to get close to an evil character, doing evil things would be the way to do it, so that would change your game dramatically. So that one feature there stands a chance of making major changes in your game, simply because you'd want to be closer to this character. And robot enemies, I think I saw that one coming, to be honest. There's only one fully fleshed out robot in the game, apparently, and you see that in the trailer. Everything else is a utility robot or a bad guy. So, 
but uh, it's good to know. You know, spaceship, spaceship, space suit buffs. Sorry, space suit buffs. This is just. This sounds like a No Man's Sky feature. You know, where if you've got a toxic planet, you've got to have a special suit. So you can imagine having a set of nine suits in your closet for different planets with different things on, or maybe one suit where you've got to constantly change the mods around. No, I really don't like that feature. I didn't like it in No Man's Sky, and I don't like it now. I thought a spacesuit should either be protecting the user, or it shouldn't be. You know, there shouldn't be any, oh, it's not good enough for that planet. Although, to be honest, um, this is for gameplay reasons mainly, rather than realism reasons. I don't think it. Don't think the idea adds much to the game. I didn't like it in No Man's Sky. I don't think it's going to work too well in um, Starfield. Uh, Bethesda are now designing games with the expectation that players will be playing their games for years. Well, they are. People do play their games for years. And um, I do wonder how they're going to make that work. I mean, I think it links to the next two things where it says they've taken on modders and the Creation Club content. I think that's how they're going to do it. Because if you, if you think about it, right, the only way to keep a game fresh for years is to constantly produce new content. That would mean modders producing new content. Creation Club would become a focus where they can not only make money so the game can constantly generate funds for them to pay for these mods to keep the free content fresh. When we see it in, um, in the Elder Scrolls Online with a constant stream of stuff that you've got to buy with their own currency, which I disagree with completely because basically all they're doing is they're hiding the fact you're paying an awful lot for something that just isn't worth it. It's kind of like playing like, I mean, it's like get buying horse armor for 15 quid instead of like five, like it was. It's vastly overpriced, generally ripping off people, leaving a bad feeling in the, you know, bad feeling in them when they see what's going on. Um, generally, I agree with it. I think it's a good approach. I just know it'll be heavily abused and used to milk is dry. But if they find other ways of uh, making the game feel fresh for longer, and maybe, you know, use these, the funds generated through this to keep releasing updates and new features to the game, you know, over a number of years. And they commit to that support for a, de a decade instead of like a couple of years. Then, yeah, that could be a really good thing for us. We could end up with a, a game that in 10 years time is a lot more advanced than it is now, kind of No Man's Sky kind of style, because the original No Man's Sky was pathetic compared to what it is today. It's a very different game today. If Bethesda had taken the leaf out of No Man's Sky book or Hello Games book, then um, that would be a good idea. I think most of us can agree. Although, to be honest, when they add content and stuff like that, it usually breaks a few mods, so I can see a few panic videos coming down the line because of that. But generally speaking, though, yeah, that's a good idea. Now, the uh, Fallout TV show, this is an interesting one because they started making the sets, and in the video you see a few clips of the sets, right? Oh, yeah, I've seen a few clips of the sets anyway. But uh, they're trying to make it as close as possible, but it's not going to be um, a TV series of a game. It's going to be a TV series that's part of the whole world. So whilst it will draw upon features from the game, it will also be adding features back into the franchise. So the next game might draw upon features from the TV series. So it's kind of a self-fulfilling loop. Unlike The Witcher, where you had that kind of situation where, where you had like, um, you know, people trying to rewrite the original author's stuff and annoying everybody. They will be adding to this universe, not rewriting background material. So most writers like to add their stamps of things, not always copy you know the original author. So they'll get their chance to shine in these TV series and become part of the Fallout world without stepping on anybody's toes. And I think that's a really good thing. That I think that is something we really needed to see. The Witcher could have probably done something similar. You know, let the um, TV series add to the books rather than just copy them, but they didn't. So, I mean, it's probably a way around a lot of the uh, things we see on TV today when someone tries to rewrite history, so to speak, or rewrite a classic book. Anyway, I'll uh, I'll leave a link to the TV show, well, the TV show, the interview below for you. Um, it's, it's interesting, and I'll see you in the next one.